deputy function do you want to make a contribution and maybe then with the agreement of the house if deputy, because we're running ahead if deputy sherlock comes in we'll allow yeah him to. no problem okay well, thank you I don't have a problem with that anyway. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Minister. Um, the Child Care Act of 1991 is the primary piece of Irish legislation governing the welfare of children who are in need of care and protection currently. That Act recognises the principle that it generally is in the best interest of a child to be brought up in his or her own, his or her own family. We welcome the progress made with the Child Care Amendment Bill 2009 and the Minister's acknowledgement that the current system in provision of the guardian ad litem is flawed and needs to be changed. Through this process of change, it is crucial that the best interest of the child is at the heart of any decision-making affecting that child. Also, in order that the best possible advocacy is provided for every child who is in the need of representation, children's lives who will be affected by the decisions made in courts. The guardian ad litem system, as it currently operates, is not fit for purpose. It is completely unregulated, there is no oversight or accountability, and the role of the GAL is not, defended, or sorry, not defined in legislation. The appointment of the guardian ad litem in court proceedings is at the discretion of the judge, meaning that access to a GAL is inconsistent across the state. We know that over the past three years, the provision of this service has cost the state approximately 46.1 million, which is obviously a huge amount of money that cannot be quantified in terms of value for money, as there is no clear payment structure in place. While I personally have no issue or difficulty with money being spent in the provision of services that benefit children, obviously this system has got to change where we have to see and be able to quantify that value for money. A regulated system can operate on a much more cost-effective basis, as evidenced by similar services in other jurisdictions, such as the children's hearings in Scotland, which are known as the CHS. We need a better service for the most vulnerable children in our society while being able to quantify costs. We believe there is a huge amount of money being wasted while at the same time an inconsistent and relatively ad hoc service is provided to our most vulnerable children. And that would be my biggest issue and concern with it, that it is um, unfortunately um, inconsistent. There is so much that needs to change in family law in this state and the manner in which we treat children in the courts. There are numerous points I would like to make on how I believe those positive changes could happen. But for the purpose of this bill at second stage today, I will keep my comments to the relevant sections of the bill, which I feel need to be revisited and urgently addressed. So while this is a little bit technical, and I'm not really a massive fan of having a technical speech, uh, obviously there's times where you, where you need to do that. So section 35B2, where children whose cases are before the High Court who are going to be placed in special care will always be appointed a guardian ad litem. This is the correct approach and we welcome the fact that this is a standard practice. However, children whose cases are before the District Court regarding applications to place them in care, whether it's with relatives or in non-relative foster care or in residential units, are not automatically entitled to a guardian. And this places these children at a serious disadvantage and may not be constitutional. All children in childcare care, child care should automatically be appointed a guardian ad litem to ensure their wishes and feelings are heard in these important proceedings. And the latest figures from the Child Care Law Report show that about 53% of cases presently do have a GAL in place. However, that means that there's 47% of cases with children who, are, who don't have that type of representation. Therefore, we will seek to amend Section 35B3 on this basis. Finally, with regard to this part of the bill and a child's entitlement to a guardian ad litem, we believe the child should be party to the proceedings to ensure that they have quality, sorry, equality in the proceedings. This would be in line with practice that currently exists in the north of Ireland and also in England. The child's voice must be heard wherever and as much as possible while protecting their emotional and psychological well-being. Then section two in rela relation to entitlement to legal representation. As the bill is currently drafted, children may or may not be appointed a guardian ad litem. Subsequent to this, the child's guardian may or may not be allowed to engage a solicitor as outlined in section 35D2. Therefore, legal representation is not a guaranteed right to the guardian. It presents a situation where all parties but the child who is at the centre of the case and who the case is essentially about is not guaranteed legal representation. The child out of all parties involved is therefore the least represented. The child is at a serious dis 
disadvantage in relation to the proceedings, as both the child and family agency will have legal representation, and you can be absolutely assured that they will, and so will the parents if they wish to instruct a solicitor. The child, on the other hand, has a number of hurdles to overcome in relation to having a guardian or legal representation. Surely it is the vulnerable and innocent child at the centre of the case who should have the most representation above everyone else and who should be prioritised, but at a minimum treated equally. And I will say that a number of um, children's rights solicitors were in contact with us in relation to that and their concerns around that and the possibility of, of litigation into the future if this issue is not addressed. In cases where the parents choose not to engage in the court process or are not capable of doing so, as is often the case, there may be no one to hold the child and family agency to account in relation to ensuring that the child's wishes are being taken into account. Yet another reason as to why we believe guardians should have the right to legal representation on behalf of the children they are advocating for, we feel that this definitely needs to be revisited. In relation to Section 35G of the Bill, it is ambiguous in relation to whether the Guardian ad litem will be entitled to all information regarding the case they are in charge of. This may compromise their ability to advocate fully and effectively for the child if they do, do not get access to this. Section 35H of the Bill should be strengthened to allow the GAL to be retained in the case where an order is discharged. The Bill is ambiguous around this. Due to the high turnover of social workers, the Guardian is frequently the only professional who is consistently involved in the case and who is a constant in a child's life throughout proceedings. We would look for assurances around allowing a GAL to be retained in the case where an order is discharged. As we understand, the bill attempts to limit the Guardian's ability to call witnesses and to cross-examine witnesses. This compromises their ability to advocate fully and most effectively for the child. Finally, in the event that the child is not a party to the proceedings, there is a legitimate argument that the Guardian ad litem should be a party to the proceedings. To summarise, with amendments to the sections highlighted, this bill has the potential to be a bill that could improve the protection of children, but in its current version we believe this bill would have a retrograde impact and would in fact weaken advocacy and protection of the most vulnerable of our children. I would also like to reinforce the recommendation made by the Children and Youth Affairs Committee, who strongly recommend that there should be no involvement of TUSLA in relation to the provision of the GAL service. And this is essential for absolute impartiality. And I would seriously um, appeal to you, Minister, but also to all deputies, that if we do have an amendment and if the committee has an amendment in relation to this, that it, it would be strongly looked at because there cannot be any... Uh, crossover in relation to this independent service and TUSLA. Uh, finally, Minister, and to your officials, I hope that you're open to taking on board our concerns and will consider our amendments, which we will be submitting at a later stage, so that we can work together to improve and strengthen the much-needed bill. That's always my approach and, in general, our approach to try and uh, work out what we see the difficulties are, and I do think it has good potential, but we definitely I need to address some of these things that um, have obviously not just been highlighted by ourselves but by solicitors who deal with children's rights and obviously they're at the, dealing with this every single day and know exactly what they're talking about so it's possible maybe as well that um, you might meet with some of those groups minister or some of those solicitors so they could um, discuss their concerns as well thanks very much Chair. thank you deputy, deputy.